This third lecture will deal with the two-dimensional echocardiography standard views. At the completion of this learning module, you will, uh, should understand the acoustic windows that are used for imaging in transthoracic echocardiography, four of the standard views employed, and it'll be a revision of uh, sonoanatomy as well. Why do we bother with standard views? Well, part of the reason is uh, to have um, some reproducibility. When you go from patient to patient, you'll be able to obtain a standard data set. Also, uh, inter-observer um, variability will be decreased, such that any two people performing an echo will arrive at similar, if not the same, images. It certainly eases into professional communication, and there is sort of uh, an expectation of echo-trained people that uh, the views will be presented in a standard way to assist in inter interpretation. And when you're starting out, it certainly simplifies the data that you're getting and the understandability so that you will be able to turn to any echocardiography textbook and understand at least some of the images that are being presented there. Now, firstly, the heart is not really amenable to echocardiography. Uh, if one looks at the, the chest wall, the heart is hidden behind the sternum and lies between the ribs with air-filled lungs uh, in close proximity. This means that we have to use what are known as acoustic windows uh, to image the heart through areas that allow passage of ultrasound. So three of the commonly used windows are the parasternal, just to the left of the sternum, somewhere between the second and the fourth intercostal space. The apical window, approximately where the cardiac apex beat is felt, but can sometimes be further lateral and inferior. So from the midclavicular to the anterior axillary line between the fifth and the sixth intercostal space. And the subcostal window, which we are familiar with from uh, fast scanning. In difference to, um, uh, from um, radiological and anatomical annotation, uh, the imaging planes for the heart um, are a bit different. So in uh, radiology practice or in anatomy, we learn about sagittal, axial and coronal planes, uh, all orthogonal or 90 degrees to each other. Uh, however, in echo practice, we relate the planes to the tilt and to the anatomy of the heart. So the, the great vessels, the base of the heart, is more medial and more posterior. The apex is more lateral, more anterior. So the heart is a bit tilted. Because of this, we refer to short, long and four chamber planes. The short axis is approximately uh, in the atrioventricular groove and uh, runs through the uh, fibrous skeleton of the heart around the uh, level of the, uh, the valves. At right angles to that is the long axis plane, which extends from the apex to the, the great vessels and is directed anteroposteriorly. And at right angles to both of those is the four chamber plane, which once again is from the apex to the base of the heart but cuts through the heart in such a way as to display the four chambers. Before we get on to the, uh, the actual standard views, uh, we need to revise transducer movements. So these are the cardinal movements that can be performed with the transducer, uh, and it simplifies things if we use a standard nomenclature. So first of all, we can translate or move the probe. This is where the angle the probe makes to the skin stays constant, but the position on the body uh, is changed. So one can move the probe superiorly towards the head, inferiorly towards the feet, left, right, medial, lateral. The next movement is a tilt or sweep. This is where the angle of the transducer is changed, but the position remains constant. The angle is changed by uh, tilting the broad side of the transducer. 
uh, such that the beam is directed more anteriorly or more posteriorly or perhaps more superiorly or more inferiorly. So the descriptor refers to the direction the beam is being pointed rather than the movement itself. Angulation, also known as heel-toe or rocking, refers to movement of the probe either towards the probe marker side or away from the probe marker side. So once again, it's a change of the angle, but not of the broad side of the probe, but of the narrow side of the probe. Lastly, we can rotate the probe along its long axis without changing any angles or positions, and this is described as being clockwise or anti-clockwise. This is a listing of some of the standard views. Only those shown in white will be described in this course. Uh, the rest are beyond the scope of the course. Firstly, the parasternal long axis. So here the transducer is at the left sternal edge, somewhere between the second and the fourth intercostal space, with the probe marker, shown as a red dot, pointing to the patient's right shoulder. The probe is aligned along a long axis from the right shoulder to the cardiac apex. Start high up, sweep across, move down an intercostal space, sweep across, move down, sweep across. In performing this zigzag motion, you will find the best imaging uh, position uh, for this view. It is not constant in all people, um, so you do need to search for it. By convention in uh, echocardiography practice, the screen image is displayed so that the probe marker and screen marker are shown on the right of screen. This means your probe marker is pointing towards the right shoulder, the aorta and great vessels are towards that side, so the aorta, aortic valve, will appear on the right of screen. Conversely, the non-probe marker side, which is facing the left ventricular apex, will display on the left side of the screen. Here is a moving image of the parasternal long axis in a normal patient. At the top of the screen is the right ventricular outflow tract. This is the anteroceptum. So by definition, if you see the aortic valve and you are in a long axis plane, then the anterior most wall that is shown has to be the anteroceptum. This is the left ventricular cavity, posterior wall. This bright line is the reflection of the pericardium. The mitral valve is seen here with the long anterior mitral leaflet, shorter, slightly less mobile posterior mitral leaflet. Left atrium here. That is the descending aorta, not seen clearly on this particular patient. Aortic valve, right coronary cusp left coronary cusp, and ascending aorta. Practice labelling those in your mind's eye on this unlabeled view. This next image is a zoomed up view of the left ventricular outflow tract. So here we have the left ventricular chamber, anteroceptum, posterior wall, mitral valve, anterior mitral leaflet, posterior mitral leaflet, and this is the left ventricular outflow tract formed by the anterior mitral leaflet and the basal anteroceptum just before reaching the aortic valve. The parasternal short axis is obtained by rotating the transducer 90 degrees from the long axis. So instead of the probe marker pointing to the right shoulder, it now points to the patient's left shoulder. There are different levels of this uh, view depending on the tilt or position of the probe. So one can move or tilt towards the base of the heart and display the aortic valve in cross section. One can move towards the apex beat in 
progression displaying mitral valve, then the mid-papillary left ventricular view, and finally the apex of the left ventricle. Here is an illustration of the aortic valve level. So the aortic valve is seen in cross-section in the middle of the image. Here it's been labelled, uh, the three cusps have been labelled as right coronary, left coronary, non-coronary cusp. Note that the non-coronary cusp lies opposite the uh, interatrial septum. So deep to the aortic valve is the left atrium. To the left of screen or to the right of the aortic valve is the right atrium. The thin line separating is the uh, tricuspid valve, then the right ventricular outflow tract going clockwise, then the pulmonary artery. Here, on a moving image, aortic valve in the middle. So we had outflow tract, tricuspid valve here, aortic valve showing three cusps, right atrium here. This fuzzy white line is the interatrial septum, left atrium here, pulmonary valve just seen at the two o'clock position, and then sometimes you can see the main pulmonary artery and even its bifurcation down more posteriorly. Moving towards the apex, we get to the mid-papillary muscle level. This is a particularly good view for rapid assessment of the global function of the left ventricle and the right ventricle. In this example, we're looking at a normal 31-year-old heart. Excuse the stuttering video, but that is a normal contracting dancing donut. Um, here we see the medial and lateral papillary muscles. Moving to the apical four-chamber view, so the probe is in the intercostal uh, space, fifth, sixth intercostal space, midclavicular to anterior axillary line, uh, directed towards the right shoulder with the probe marker into the left axilla. The resulting image will look like this, displaying the left ventricle towards the probe marker side, the left atrium, right ventricle with a moderator band shown here, which defines it as right ventricle, and the right atrium here. Now, it may look as though there's a hole in the interatrial septum. This is a normal appearance in this view. Because this is at, uh, in the same direction as your, uh, as your ultrasound beam, there is often a dropout uh, in this area which can appear as a defect. To define an uh, atrial septal defect, you need to image at right angles to it. Lastly, this is our familiar view from the fast. However, remember, the screen marker is now on the right of screen. The probe marker is also flipped now to the left of the patient rather than to the right of the patient. The image you get is identical. So this is the right ventricle with the free ball seen there, the interventricular septum, right atrium, left ventricle, left atrium. Note that you're not seeing the aortic valve. So this is not anteroseptum, this is inferoseptum. Lastly, by turning the probe anti-clockwise so that the probe marker is pointing straight up and sometimes moving slightly to the patient's right, the IVC will come into view as it enters the right atrium. And this is a useful view for looking for IVC collapse as a sign of or as an indicator of right atrial pressure. So lastly, we've provided an overview of the standard cardiac views. You should now practice obtaining those views, and if there's a particular view you find difficult, please seek help, as there may be a simple way of improving your view.